reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to supply. Reach out. Tonight, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3. Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, enjoy the moment. Solomon is giving us a sermon on life, and he opens it by identifying himself as the preacher. The opening words of Ecclesiastes in chapter 1 and verse 1 read, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So he gives us his identity that he's the preacher and uh, he's the son of King David and he's the current king in Jerusalem. And then he gives us the theme of his message as every good sermon should have right at the beginning in verse two. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And vanity from the... Uh, Hebrew, the word habel, is, it means uh, a breath, it means a vapor, it means futility, it means really uh, uh, just nothingness. It just is over so quickly. And uh, we find here that he's looking at life, and he's well qualified to talk about life, uh, because God gave him more wisdom than any human being ever had or would have. Uh, when he was enthroned as the king, he asked for wisdom to judge God's people. And God said, because you have not asked for riches for yourself or fame, uh, I'm going to give you wisdom as nobody ever has had, and I'm going to give you all wealth and uh, blessings that you might imagine as well. So he had wisdom unlike anybody else. He had a very godly father, and uh, some of the proverbs that Solomon wrote reflect the wisdom of his father. Uh, sadly, he did not have that relationship with God that his father did have. Uh, that's the uh, interesting thing about life is that we cannot, we can inherit uh, certain characteristics from our parents. You can't inherit spirituality. Uh, we enter heaven single file, it's been said, and we are not able to uh, have the wisdom and the uh, anointing of our parents. We have to find it for ourselves. And so he did not have that same relationship with God that his father had. Uh, he started off rather well, and you look at Proverbs and you'll see that uh, he wrote that around, he wrote around 950 BC. Uh, he wrote Proverbs and, King of, and Song of Solomon, and he had a sense of godliness, to be sure. But uh, 11 years later, he turned from the Lord in a very remarkable way, not all at once, but over time. And uh, he was uh, very backslidden. And uh, he really got into... Uh, areas of sin because of the wives that he had. He married uh, a thousand women and uh, brought in all of their pagan practices. They never converted. Um, and we're not even really sure if uh, Solomon's mother, Bathsheba, was saved or not. We have no evidence of that, so we don't even know if he had any godly upbringing from her. But we find that um, he is uh, not really uh, the same man by the time he's writing uh, Ecclesiastes and he's looking at life and again he's speaking with wisdom. Uh, what he says is true from the human perspective but we have to look at this book with, with several lenses. We have to look at it through the lens of uh, reality of what it's like apart from God and what is life like without Jesus and then what is it like with God and uh, we've, we've, certainly it's, it's a challenging book I was thinking this week about Ecclesiastes. There's no other book in the Bible that really deals with life the way this book does. Uh, we, we have many themes in many different books, but this one deals with life. And that's important because we all have the gift of life and we have to learn how to live it. And the question is, are we really learning how to live life? Or are we falling back on the old saying, what's it all about? Alfie. You know, what is it all about? 
And so we have to, even as Christians, we have to ask, what's it all about? What's God, what's God doing? And we wrestle with the question of life. So in many ways, Ecclesiastes is about as important a book in the Bible as you can get because we have to grapple with the issues that Solomon grappled with every single day. And then we have to help other people as they grapple with those issues as well. So let's begin. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us to understand, and then we shall begin. Heavenly Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. Father, we are without the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. And Father, we know the Holy Spirit is always with us, but we ask for the power of the Holy Spirit. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to come and to teach us tonight. Teach us from your holy word. Anoint us, Lord, to bring forth your word in power and truth. Speak through us tonight. Speak through your people tonight. Come, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. In your name we pray, amen. We, uh, last week, uh, dwelt on the first eight verses of chapter three of Ecclesiastes. They're the most quoted verses. Uh, so much wisdom there, and we uh, didn't even touch the surface in 45 minutes. We're not going to get into the, the depth of it. I want to just have us read it, and that's going to set us up for tonight's discussion. Um, and the uh, theme of the first eight verses is that everything has its time. So Kelly's going to read the first eight verses. We're not going to comment on it, but it's going to just catapult us into tonight's discussion. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. So much wisdom in those eight verses, and I encourage you to look at the sermon from last week. It's on the internet in various places, Facebook and the YouTube and what have you, and our own website, reachoutfellowship.com. But we, um, life is filled with all of these um, antithetical experiences, uh, these opposites. And uh, we need to, in order to be happy and productive and on track with God, we need to be knowing what's going on. What is going on? I mentioned before that one tribe that is hardly mentioned at all in the Bible fascinates me, and that is the tribe of Issachar. And Issachar knew the times. Well, I don't know what that means. Nothing further is said about it, but they knew the times. Somehow they knew what was going on in Israel, what was going on with God, what was going on with life. I would like to Pray for all of us that we can know the times. What's going on? People get all concerned about the current events, and well, we should. But what's going on, and what's the timetable? And what is the lesson we're supposed to learn about these times? And all of the events of these times, and all of the events of my life, help me to know, Lord, what you're doing. Help me to know exactly what you're doing and how I should respond. So that's all we're going to really say about verse 1 through 8. Read it time and time again. And as I mentioned, at the, uh, I went to the Albany Academy here locally, and the headmaster every year would open up the new year by reading uh, verses 1 to 8 from Ecclesiastes. He didn't comment on it, but we heard those words over and over and over again. May we know the times and how to act within those times. Amen. So tonight in verse 9, let's begin as we are going to be talking about uh, the God-given task of life. And let's look at verses uh, 9 through 15. What profit has the worker from that in which he labors? I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into their, in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. 
I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it, that men should fear before him. That which is has already been, and what is to be has already been. And God requires an account of what is past. So words of wisdom from the wisest man who ever lived. And again, let's understand what wisdom was that God gave him. Uh, God has given certain people extraordinary wisdom, uh, knowledge of facts of uh, existence, of life, and what it's all about. Many of them become uh, professors in universities and uh, think tanks and what have you. Um, but that is different from spirituality, we know that. Uh, to know a lot uh, in life does not mean that you know God or that you even know how to live life properly. Um, so that's a different thing. God has given everyone an even playing field as far as spirituality. Everyone is able to come to God and receive his wisdom and his anointing and his relationship. Uh, but as far as life and wisdom and facts, not all are advantaged the same way. Some men have to drop out of school if they ever go to school at all. Over in Afghanistan now, the young, the young ladies cannot go to school beyond a certain uh, level. Uh, it's very, very rigid. Many in our families had to drop out of school to work and support families. And some in our families just dropped out because they didn't like school. And so they, well, they walk around with a fourth or fifth grade education. They might not have all the knowledge and wisdom of others who perhaps have the privilege of going to school to get a, a college degree or beyond to master's or doctoral levels. But as far as spirituality, knowing God and hearing God, we all have the same level, the playing field. God will reach all of us if we'll call out to him. But this is a man who had extraordinary knowledge. He had wisdom beyond anybody who has ever lived. Uh, as far as education, no one in his time had more education than Moses. Moses was the most educated man in, in Egypt, uh, being raised to be Pharaoh's, uh, as Pharaoh's son, to be the future Pharaoh. And uh, we, we still marvel at what Egypt knew about so many facts, including trigonometry and geometry and what have you. Uh, nobody knew the word of God perhaps more than the Apostle Paul, and yet he wasn't even saved. Uh, until the road to Damascus experience. So having wisdom is one thing, and it's good. Uh, knowledge is one thing, but to know God is everything. So let's look at verse 9. What profit has the worker from that in which he labors? Now we're all working, aren't we? That's a promise that God made to us about working. And uh, we've all moaned and groaned about our jobs at one time or another, haven't we? Don't, don't raise your hand. But... Let me say this, that if you have found your job to be rather tough, difficult, um, and uh, it made, made you sweat, that's a promise from God. Because of the sin of Adam and Eve, God made a promise. And the promise to uh, Adam uh, and to man and to woman as well is in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you should eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So you're going to have uh, a tough road to hoe, so to speak. Life's going to be tough. And if you take it literally, you can moan and groan as you work on the weeds and you mow the grass. And you can be complaining about it, or you can be grateful for it and see everything through the gift of God of life. Thank you, Lord, that it's spring. Thank you that there are weeds, and thank you there's grass, and thank you that there are gonna be mosquitoes, and it's gonna be warm, and it's gonna be humid, and we're gonna perspire. But guess what, I'm alive. I'm alive, and uh, I thank you for this season. And I thank you the season's not going to last, because I'm gonna be wishing for this season six months from now, when the wind begins to blow and it gets cold. Depends on how you look at life. And so he's saying here that, that labor is going to be tough, but God promised it would be. 
And, uh, and as far as uh, labor is concerned, my mother used to say if I complained about something, including ministry, mm. she used to say, what else are you going to do? Good question, what else are you going to do? And so uh, <laughs> you, you just thank God that you are alive, you're on this side of the ground, and uh, you can take care of the weeds. Or if you, if you don't want to take care of the weeds, let them grow. They'll, they'll die in six months anyway with the first frost. So don't, don't sweat it, Make it uh, snakes literally or, or spiritually. Uh, but he says here, what profit has the worker from that which, in which he labors? Verse 2, let's read that, or verse 10. I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. God-given task, the work that I have to do is God-given. That's important. Your job is God-given. If you're employed, that job is God-given. If you're retired, whatever you're doing in retirement is God-given. And the only thing that's worse than your job is no job. No job. My father used to say, we had a client one day who was annoying me in the law office, and he said, my dad said, Jerry, the only thing that's worse than clients is no clients. And that is so true. So, Lord, I don't like my job. I don't like having to do this or that. But it's God-given. Help me to see it through your eyes. Help me to see it through your perspective. And thank God that I have a job. Thank God that I can do this job. That I can get up, that I can walk, I can use my hands. I can uh, have a break from it. And I won't have to do this job, perhaps if I do it well, I won't have to do it again for another day or another week. But thank you, Lord, for work. It's a, it depends on how we look at it. And we have to wrestle with this every day. All of us have to. Learning how to live life. That's why Ecclesiastes, you can spend the rest of your life in Ecclesiastes and learn a little bit about how to live life. So I've seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. That word are indicates to me you're supposed to work. You're supposed to work. The Apostle Paul was addressing uh, in one of his letters about not working. If they don't want to work, they don't eat. And there are some people who just don't want to work. See, and every family has them. Our family has it. Your family has it. There's always those who don't want to work or they work marginally, as little as possible, love unemployment, just love to sit around. And then there are others who are just working more morning, noon, and night. Two jobs, three jobs. But work is to be... Now, make sure that what you're doing is a God-given task. That's another question. Is this job that I'm doing of you, Lord, or is it of me? Did I choose this job or did you? If you chose it, great. Then help me to enjoy, enjoy it and be occupied with it and thank you for it. If I'm in the wrong job then place me in the right job as well. You know, it's a really good thing to put into your perspective. I hadn't been thinking about that in a while. I used to clean houses in between some of my crazy jobs and my lifestyle. And I used to get these really great jobs cleaning houses. Um, and I would go into the house and I would pretend, I know this sounds crazy because I'm crazy, and I would say, you know, okay, I'm doing this for you, Lord. I, I like had CEOs of the post, they had a house up, I had doctors, I had, I was in big houses. And I used to love their houses because they were so beautiful. And um, I would clean the house and I would say, you know, I'm doing this for you, Lord. I, I'm do How did I say it? I used to say, I'm doing this as unto you. Yeah. And um, so if I'm cleaning their sink, their toilet, whatever, it was unto you. They loved me and I did such a good job. I was, I was very innocent then. And I look back and I'm thinking, you know, we need to practice that more. Whatever we're doing, right? Whatever I'm doing, I'm going to really try to work on those, those things. Um, you know, I'm doing this for you, Lord. Today I was doing some things I didn't really, I was kind of aggravated. But I just started praising the Lord and doing that because sometimes I do things over and over 20 times. You know, you got to pick up the same things and it's annoying. Wash the same thing off the wall or whatever. But I'm doing this as unto the Lord this is your house, Lord. And I think if we take that perspective, we take on a different attitude. That's right. And sometimes God's going to throw you a curve. As you know, in my situation here, I've always been schooled to believe that uh, hopefully a, a pastor can stay in the pastoral role and that's it and leave the tent making from that he left. But in my case, God has called me back into tent making, as you know. I was an attorney for uh, 14 years and 
that I left uh, to start this church with mother and dad. And then after 40 years in this, uh, the Lord has brought me back into teaching law again. And I had one course this winter. We got through that, loved my students. I only had three students. And they, uh, I was the paralegal department teaching them law and nobody else to teach. And then these poor students uh, have to have a lot more courses to graduate, to become paralegals and to go on to become lawyers. And there's nobody else to teach them. So I said, Duh, I'll, I'll teach them. So now I'm teaching three courses over there and building a paralegal department. Never expected that, never wanted that. When I left the law practice, I was happy to do God's work. But you never know what God's gonna do. And you just simply, we had encouragement from the people here in the congregation and others, and, uh, and now I'm just... And uh, he does have a skip at his jump. And it's, I have to... Or jump at We're working with 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds. <laughs> I'm like, <clears throat> hey, I'm really happy for you, yeah. you know? And I told everybody here that at the age of 81, I got my first job working for somebody else. I never worked for anybody else all my life. Well, I, my first job was my father's law firm. If he didn't hire me, mother would divorce him. So he had no choice but to hire me. And then we started the church and who's gonna fire myself, right? So at 81, they hired me. And as of six months, they still kept me on. So, but seriously, you never know what, where the road's gonna turn. So don't complain, but be grateful for it. Be grateful. And I have to say, and, and it's true, that even though I had a faculty meeting the other day, other night, totally lost. All these, these are all professional uh, teachers who know all about research, people, stuff that Robin would know about, and how to develop lesson plans and, and stuff, and ethos and pathos and logos. I have no idea what they're talking about, and I'm Googling <laughs> all, all I know how to do is teach the Bible. And uh, still, I'm learning how to do that. But I, I walked out of there knowing absolutely hardly anything and exhilarated. So you just let God give you the direction that he has for you. Thank God for that job. He has surprises too. He has surprises. God for you. does. He, I'm so, sometimes I'm so surprised the things he does. Yep. I'm like, wow, what are you doing? Like, this yep. is really cool. So enjoy the moment. Enjoy what you have right now. Um, don't live in the past. Oh, in the past, we had a congregation that filled in the, in around the corner, or the future, what's going to happen? Will the church, you know, tomorrow, will people even go to church? They're getting so much away from church now. Don't, don't live in the, thank God for today. We've got a family here tonight, and thank God for, for all you have is right now. Enjoy this moment. Tomorrow may never come for us. We don't know. I think that mostly, though, in, in life, so many people want to enjoy, we always want the next thing. We want to go here, we That's want to right. do this, we want to do that, we want to get the different house, we That's want a right. different car, we want to, you know, we have to just, there is peace in the day. That's right. Now, a lot of wisdom in verse 12. Let's read that. I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. Uh, so, um, as far as today is concerned... Best thing to do wow. is to uh, rejoice. And we were just talking Re about rejoice that. Rejoice in today and then do good. What can I do good for other people? How can I help them? Can I pray for them? Can I pray for them? I walked out of the faculty meeting Tuesday night. I had a message from Diane. I couldn't take the call because I was in the faculty meeting. Got out of the meeting at 8 o'clock, called her back, and she said, I'd like to have prayer for so-and-so. And I said, Diane, you're always interceding for other people. Wonderful. You're always caring about them. Let's pray together. So I was able to rejoice. I walked out of that meeting. I was refreshed by the meeting, even though I didn't understand it. And then I was having, I had a chance to pray with a sister and to do some good. And she did some more good. And I'm sure after she finished that call, she must have encouraged somebody uh, where she lives. And uh, just rejoice in today and do good. All you have is this moment, this day. Live it to the full with rejoicing and doing good. And you're going to be mightily, mightily blessed. But there's also another benefit, and I love the next verse. And Kelly's going to read that one in just a moment here. Yeah, I just thought of when I, just my hero, Dr. Uh, Zev Zelenko, said, turn from evil and do good. That's that right. was his, his verse when he, uh, he would preach to everybody, turn from evil and do good. And that was a medical doctor who said that, amen. And so while you're rejoicing and while you're doing good, and these are, we're actually crawling through Ecclesiastes, but it's worth it because we're learning how to live, learning how to uh, endure life, live life, uh, get the best out of it. And uh, so rejoice, do good, in verse 13, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. So 
It's time to eat and drink. I love that part, don't you? I love to eat, I love to drink, and um, it's a gift of God. So just yesterday, which was my day, or Tuesday was my, no, Wednesday was my day. So I started off teaching law over at school, and I enjoyed that, and then I uh, came home and uh, had a little lunch, I enjoyed that, and then I got out and mowed the lawn, and, uh, and I enjoyed that, and then I did just a little bit of uh, Bible work, and enjoyed that, and then had another meal, and so you learn to live moment by moment and to enjoy the work. Did I enjoy the class with this, the students? They were exhilarated, they were turned on. The teacher said that of all, all the classes they have, these students are the most involved and excited of all the cl classes in the school. They really are excited about what they're doing. And I got excitement out of that. But I'm gonna tell you something, I mowed the front strip of the lawn, the side, and uh, over in the corner here, and I looked at that lawn and I said, I enjoyed that. I think my front lawn and side lawn look great. I enjoyed that. And I made some spaghetti, etc. That's my life. And you have your own story to tell. What else is there? What else is there? You have enjoy to, the moment and do it as unto the Lord and have, be grateful for you it. You have to enjoy. And when you practice that, I, you've got to practice that. These are A lot of these people are older here, so they've already practiced. They learn. But not in a mad way that you're older, but... I think when you're young, you don't know how to do that. Um, sometimes I need reminders, but once I get back on the track, I can do that. Mm -hmm. And pr everything we do is, can be a blessing. Absolutely. Enjoy it. It's all important. Mowing the lawn is not as important as teaching law to students. That's wrong. Teaching students law in college is not as important as teaching the Bible right now. That's wrong. What's the most important thing? doing whatever God has called you to do at that moment. And what you're doing at that moment is the most important thing. So there's no hierarchy of importance. Oh, I wish I was doing that. No, you just are grateful for today. And uh, whatever you're doing, do it unto the Lord. There's nothing more important or enjoyable. And then it's time to eat. And I love the dinner bell, don't you? It's the gift of God. All right, verse 14. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing taken from it. God does it, that men should fear before him. Let's stop there for a moment. Mm -hmm. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. He understands God is eternal. He understands he's omnipotent, and it's going to be forever. And we need to know that as well. God is, whatever God does, it's going to last. Mm -hmm. His word's going to last. Uh, we're going to last in him, mm -hmm. and uh, he is going to last and nothing can be added to it. God is totally and completely in control. He's omnipresent. Mm. He is totally ev everywhere. Well, you know, I can improve God's day by, no, no. <laughs> no, we, we can't add to God, we can't add to anything else. All we can do is say, Lord, what part may I play in today for you? How may I serve you? What may I do for you? And whatever you do is gonna be important, but it's all part of his design for you. And again, there's no hierarchy. You're in assisted living and you're sharing your faith with a sister or a brother at the dinner table. There's nothing more important than that. You're enjoying a meal. You're letting your light shine. You can't even really necessarily let your light shine by talking about Jesus, but you're just loving. And with these students that I have over in college, I'm not called to be a preacher there. Uh, they know what I do, but I just, in my own little way, try to just be encouraging to them. And uh, at the age of 18 and 19, they've got fears and concerns and questions and just trying to gently, lovingly let the light of Christ shine. Nothing's more important than just being you and let your light shine in whatever way you can. Because people are attracted to that. They are. People are attracted to love. Mm -hmm. They're attracted to compassion, empathy, understanding. And when you show that, even non-believers who may be even an atheist that shows love and kindness um, to someone they're going to be attracted that's to. That's right, that's right. And you have the gift of ministry, so. Well, we just, uh, and the, the ministry part does help, too. That's where, being a Christian, uh, I don't have all the experience of these other teachers in the secular environment, but I've worked with people over the years. And, uh, you have you, grace you, you, and you, mercy. You just simply, you just, you just let the Lord... Uh, uh, shine. It's not me, it's just the Lord. It's the Lord. He and, works uh, through his people. Last day of classes, I got a hug from all the, the students, all three of them, two gals and a guy, big hug. They walked in and, and uh, got a hug on the, at the start of class. 
They say, I love you, professor. And it, it's, it's not me, it's Jesus. Just let your light they shine. They love Jesus, they just they, don't they, know it. They, just, they love Jesus, they just don't know who he is at this point. And uh, we're working on that. All right, so there's just, uh, you are important wherever you are. Oh, don't take me from the sanctified halls of a church environment into the world. Mm -hmm. No, God says, take him into the world, because I want to go out into the world. I want to didn't, be seen in the world. Didn't they say to go into all the world and preach the gospel? That's right. Yeah, the trouble with the early church was they were just all cloistered there in Jerusalem, and God had to have some persecution to drive them out and get the message elsewhere. So if you're elsewhere, let your light shine. Uh, verse 15. Um, well, let's, let's continue with verse 14. Oh. I know that whatever God does is forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear him or fear before him. We are to fear him. Yep. We're to respect him. We're to obey him. Yeah. And that which already has been. And what is to be has already been. And God requires an account of what is past. So that which is, has already been, uh, that which is has already been. And that which is to be has already been. There's nothing new under the sun that's been said. And God requires an account of what is past. Well, that's interesting because yes. he, uh, he knows that. And Jesus said regarding an account. You will give an account for every word. Every word. Ooh, <laughs> that's going to be embarrassing. <laughs> every word. Every action. He's going he's to require an accounting of it. Lord, let my lips and my life be pleasing unto you. Let the words so, of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be yeah. acceptable to we're you, We're going to have Lord. to have an accounting. Where is that accounting going to be? It's going to be here in some measure, sowing and reaping. Much of what I say and do is going to be bearing fruit or uh, when the I, opposite here. When I read that, I think about the end tales of sin. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what, what I do here is going to have a reactive uh, event, effect here on earth. I do good, it's going to be a blessing here. I do evil, it's going to be uh, evidenced here. It's going to be also in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ as rewards are handed out for that which is done for the Lord. But then also the judgment seat of Christ and this life are in preparation for the work to be done with Jesus back here on earth in the millennium. Advertisement for this coming Sunday's message, the millennium. Mm -hmm. You and I are coming back here for a thousand years with Christ and our resurrection bodies. And when the Lord says, you've been faithful over a few things, you'll be ruler over many, he's not just talking about down here on earth, but also here back on earth in the millennium. Mm. You're, someone's gonna have to rule and reign with him. And the jobs you and I are going to have in the millennium, judging from scripture, there's very little to show us that, is that we're gonna be judging with him and ruling with him. Mm. You and I are gonna be judges here we're going to be police officers down here. We're going to be ruling with a rod of iron with Jesus to make sure that his rule prevails. So you've got work to do. What you're doing here right now is real. In one sense, it's not a dress rehearsal, it's life. But in another sense, it is a dress rehearsal for what you're going to do hereafter in the millennium. And as you're faithful here, you'll be rewarded and utilized hereafter. If you're a couch potato here, you can still be saved, and I guess there are jobs, jobs for couch potatoes in the millennium, but I don't want to even go, about, you know, go down that road. Let's be productive for him, right? All right, and then we go on to verse 16. Moreover, I saw under the sun, in the place of judgment, wickedness was there, and in the place of righteousness, iniquity was there. All right, so I was surprised, he says, when I went in the place of judgment. The place of judgment would be uh, halls of justice. And again, my teaching the law to these students uh, at this point, they're, they're very new. These are the very earliest courses they have in the law. And uh, we're trying to discuss what the law is or should be. And uh, they're hopefully going to be able to understand that uh, justice does not always prevail ah. in law, in our court systems. And I think you've been around long enough to know that. Um, so I it doesn't saw, prevail in everyday life. That's right. And I just witnessed this situation just the other day, and there's really no justice. And I thought, wow, this is crazy. This isn't right. And you would think, and I've had people say, well, I want to see justice, or, you know, I'm not that this situation, but uh, just I hear that in life, and I'm like, uh, I don't 
think you're going to see, they all think they're going to have justice. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't work that way because, you know, it just doesn't. And that's right. It doesn't on the earth. The Apostle Paul uh, understood that, and that's why he told the Corinthian church, uh, among the other things that you're doing wrong is you are going to court and you are litigating with brothers and sisters in court. You shouldn't be doing that. You, as believers, will be judges. You will judge angels one day, the demonic spirits. You are going to be judges one day, and you should not be going to the world, to secular courts, and going before judges uh, who are not saved or who are not being led by the Lord. You should settle these matters yourself. That's why Paul said settle them before. That's why. Because as believers, we really shouldn't take people to court. That's right. Anyway, that's why you should, if you need to go into a system with arbitration, uh, you, you can do that. One time, I remember when I was early in ministry back 30 years or so ago. Well, sometimes you get dragged into it. Um, that I remember there was a, 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 a very large church, the largest church at that time. I'm talking back in the 90s. Mm. And uh, one of the, the most influential uh, director as far as giving and uh, influence was suing the church. Mm. And the church was wise enough to not go to court. And so they, uh, one of the uh, men called me, I, I knew him from a previous relationship in a different church, and they, uh, they were gonna go to arbitration and they were uh, they're choosing one, uh, the, the church would choose one uh, judge, so to speak. The uh, individual who was suing the church would choose another individual and a third individual would be chosen who would be uh, agreed upon by both of them. Mm. And they asked me to be the judge for one of the parties, I think for the church. It was not my church, I was here, but I was on the way to Florida on vacation and I was not able to, to be a part of it. I'd like to know how it all turned out. But they did the right thing. They did the right thing. Get, get some believers and uh, let them pray and let them make the decision because there is... Uh, it doesn't work that way in our court system, though. No. no. Uh, and when you realize... Um, but he was talking about believers, Paul was. Uh, Paul was talking about believers, right. That's right. But, um, but, but he, <clears throat> he's also saying stay out of the courts because, you, and, yeah. because they are they're not, uh, they not going to be led by the Lord necessarily. No. Um, and uh, with our judges, not to get into politics, we always seem to have it rear its ugly head, but for the most part, how are judges appointed? They're either elected or they're appointed by the governor or the president, and so therefore, who do they choose? They're gonna go People towards People of that. like persuasion politically. So, a Republican whatever that president I, whatever or that a Democratic I, president right. will choose someone of the same persuasion. Now you have cases coming before those judges. How are they going to see it? Do they have a blindfold like Lady Justice? Few of them do. That's almost an inhuman task. They will see it from their own political bias. Um, that's, that's why for why believers... They, that's they, why they try to stack it evenly. But, but you know, like with like Dr. McCullough, he got in tr uh, they tried to take his license and all that for all of his stuff he was doing. He had to get an attorney, right? And he had to go to court and he won. But sometimes you get dragged into court yep. and you have to defend yourself. That's what are right. you going to do? That's right. You're going to let them run you over and take away your, your, your rights and your license? This is, this is right. And this is what happened to us with elders who dragged us into court. It happened in our own situation with Kelly and me. We were dragged into court, sued for a million dollars personally and, and church-wise. And um, it, uh, it moved to the point of the judge and the judge wanted to insert herself Supreme Court Justice wanted to insert herself into making determinations about our bylaws and how we followed our bylaws. And Kelly, who never had a day of law I, school, this is the honest chimed God in truth. and said to our attorney, what? I, I remembered learning about um, between church, church and state. Separation of church Separate, and state. And I, I said, can't we use, and I gave some examples. And the attorney who was loads of money. He goes, let me go look. That's a good idea. He hadn't thought about that. And he hadn't. Frankly, I hadn't either as an attorney. And what does a Supreme Court justice and that's what they used. have to do they with found stuff. making pronouncements about the bylaws, which incidentally I wrote uh, for this church. And I said, separation of church and state. And she has no it. business getting her nose into the church business. 
And so we made a, an offer of a, of a modest settlement, and uh, the other party took it because their attorney said we have no case at all. Because, because they, they, they had no case at all. And we, we got out of it. Sometimes you get dragged into it, and you have to have wisdom from God how to get out of it. And that was and they, they, very, I mean, we were fretting and fretting, but a lot of people were praying. It was, it was a miracle. Sure. It was a miracle. So this is real life. It happens. We want to get on. We're just about out of time here. Uh, verse uh, 17. I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time, therefore, every purpose and for every work. So that's a good thing. Leave it to God. There's a lot of injustice going on. Leave it to God. He's going to sort it all out, whether it's in the political scene, the judicial scene, the family scene, whatever. God's going to take care of it. There's going to be a payday. He knows what he's doing. Verse 18. I said in my heart concerning the condition of the sons of men, God tests them that they may see that they themselves are like animals. That's so true. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. For what happens to the sons of men also happens to animals. One thing befalls them as one dies, so dies the other. Surely they all have one breath. Man has no advantage over animals for all is vanity. And go to one place. All. All go to one place. All are from the dust and all return to dust. Who knows the spirit of the sons of men, which goes upward, and the spirit of the animal, which goes down to the earth? So I perceive that nothing is better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that, his, that is his heritage. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him? So he uses the animals as an example, that we're like the animals. We, uh, we live, we die. We go up, he sees them going down. We, we now see through the Apostle Paul, they go up with us. <clears throat> and incidentally, you'll have well, a lot of... Well, the Bible says they had to go down first. That's right. They, they go down first. That's right. Uh, and by the way, you'll, you'll hear a lot of preachers say, well, animals can't go to heaven because they don't have a soul and they don't, they, 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 they're they not saved. Uh, no, a Foxy hasn't given her heart to the Lord, my little Shiva Inu. We'll try to get a sinner's prayer out of her later on here. Why doesn't she have a sinner's prayer? She doesn't have to. She, doesn't she didn't sin. She doesn't she, is, she suffers human life, including sickness and eventually death, not because of her sin, but because Adam sinned and animals are attached to us. They, they were under our authority and they go, they go down with us and they go up with us. They, they did not sin, they're not judged on that basis. In any event, here he says, uh, we're gonna live, we're gonna die, and they've got a short life, but they're gonna, we, we, we take care of them, but we're all alike in the sense that we live and we die. And uh, so he's not- he, So uh, rejoice and enjoy the little things and enjoy Mowing your grass. That's right. And enjoy the animals and learn from the animals. I learn a lot from the animals that we have. The Lord shows me, if you paid attention to me, Jerry, the way your animals pay attention to you, you wouldn't get into all the trouble that you do. Finally, he says here, here's your message, verse 22. So I perceive that nothing is better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his heritage. That is your heritage, rejoicing right. in your own work. That's right. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him? That's right. I don't know about tomorrow, who but I like my front him. lawn. Oh, I like my side lawn. They look good. I want you to go out in the light and say, what a great but lawn, But we don't know Jerry. what's going to happen when you're not here to mow that lawn. <laughs> I'm going to sell that house call John. I'm here. John, John's going to mow the lawn. I'm going to get a house lawn this big. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I, I said to Kelly, living for the moment, this college is, is building a paralegal program and law courses around an 81, almost 82 year old man who isn't going to be around that much longer. And they're not worried about that. Uh, they've got students who need a teacher today. They're living in the moment right well, now. You're going to live long and, enough to uh, take care of Max now. <laughs> well, that means I'll be 125 by the time we uh, go home. But, but they're, they're living for the moment. They're, they're, they have a need right now. They're taking care of it. The, the law school's got all kinds of young people out there. But God chose an old duffer who is coming on in for some reason to do this job. And, and they're just saying, we're going to take care of today. How blessed. Live in the moment. But you know what? In Christ. Those, Amen. Those kids, you're investing in, it, investing in them. They have no idea what they're receiving. Well, we're just, uh, I'm enjoying it and uh, pray for my strength. But we're all we're having fun. I'm having a good time with these kids. There is something uh, to say about being older and having wisdom. Well, that's, that's one thing. I can bring to them a lot of years of, of, of practice in the law and ministry and life. And so can you guys And, and so that. can you as well. 
you are valuable. If you're senior Very citizens, valuable. you're valuable. Very valuable. And, uh, the, the, the one good thing about our candidates, and then I'll say that, is that we got an 81-year-old and a 79-year-old, and there is, I, make, I feel good as an 81-year-old, no, that they, there's still a reason for us to exist. They do and, have some uh, wisdom, and yeah. so, you know, as you age, you, 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 you would say that you would hope you gain wisdom. Yeah, there is a, there's a tendency of, and again, some of this ageism, you're old, we don't need you, you're not important yeah. to us anymore, nonsense. Oh, yeah, uh, you're, the young people think they're great. We have a lot of, lot of wisdom great. to share and to make sure that you do it. Amen? Well, let's close in prayer. Amen. Father, we thank you for this day, and thank you for uh, those who've come out tonight. Please send your traveling mercies to bring them home safely. We pray for Renee. She's got something wrong with her lung right side. Father, we ask right now that you would touch Renee's lung and that you would heal her in Jesus' name. By the stripes of Jesus, we pray for complete healing in her lungs in Jesus' name. And Father, we ask you to bless everyone that's come tonight. May they be encouraged. Bring them home safely, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. He's passing by this moment Your needs to supply Reach out